Howdy y'all, welcome back. Today I will answer a request as well as diving into a portion of the world which I have seldom discussed before. When we think of the old world and its inhabitants arriving, for lack of a better term, into the new world, we often discuss stories of the United States, the Mound Builders, and the crux of religion which seemingly eroded whatever evidence of previous occupation these lands had to offer. At least, that's what the narrative most commonly alludes to when discussing a majority of the earliest and largest New World cities. What we find beyond the surface, and as we decode the current narrative, we often find something more substantial and mysterious. If we focus on the land south of the United States, beyond the ancient kingdoms of Mexico, through Central America, and into South America, specifically Brazil, in today's video we will discuss the officially accepted timeline of Rio de Janeiro, deciphering the currently accepted narrative while focusing on the oldest and most unique images of Rio in existence that are made available to us today. At first, I found it very difficult, nearly impossible, to find a multitude of images of Rio, especially in the old world timeline, or in the timeline before 1900. For all the history that we now discuss of Rio, I couldn't help wondering about the lack of images. Layer after layer of the history has admittedly been formed around Rio, seemingly drowning the significance of any one single piece of ancient architecture. However, I believe in working our way through the timeline and piecing this together with the images I was able to find. We will locate numerous anomalies which will help us see the true nature of the South American oasis. I then took to museums, online forums, and private paid collections to find the album entitled, and I quote, Album of the City of Rio de Janeiro, commemorative of the independence of Brazil, that was published in 1922 with photographs and images from the year 1822 through the year 1922. Once I found this album and this old world book, these photographs, I had to add that to this video, and this really made it all worthwhile. So let's get right into it. These are by far some of the most amazing photographs of any old world city that I've come across this year, especially when you compare these images to what is available about Rio on sites like Wikipedia or even in the Library of Congress. Rio de Janeiro is truly breathtaking, and this suppressed album is truly revealing. It shows the vast architecture of Rio showcased in these early photographs, and it appears to dwarf much of the architecture that was found in the rest of the New World at this time. Of note, you can also see the names of many of these buildings below the photograph, and in nearly each photograph, there is a description. We can also see the skyline in many of these images, and some of the photographs even focus on the sky and the stars, so it shows that many of these images were most likely unaltered. We can also see people in a lot of the photographs, which is useful for comparison when we look at size of this immense architecture. Some of these buildings in Rio appear like they were made for giants. They stand hundreds of feet tall, with each story of the building seeming to exceed 15, sometimes 20 feet. In these instances, the very same structures are almost always masonry with no steel, and the buildings appear ancient even in the photographs from the mid-1800s, when all of these buildings should have been relatively recent, according to the official timeline. These images also appear to tear the current narrative apart, so let's get right into it, beginning with the esoteric nature behind the history of Brazil. Rio de Janeiro, literally meaning River of January, is the capital of the Brazilian state of the same name. January, as you know, was named for the Roman god Janus, the two-faced god of time, gateways, stargates, portals, etc. Janus immortalized transformation, seeing both in the future and in the past. The river of January, Rio de Janeiro, or simply Rio, is the sixth most populous city in the Americas and the second most populous in Brazil. Interestingly, Brazil, throughout the early 20th century, 
has been linked by numerous fringe scientists, ancient historians, and some well-known authors including J.R.R. Tolkien, after years of research, to the mythical land of High Brazil. High Brazil, according to Celtic legend, is an island cloaked in mystery which sits well off the western coast of Ireland. High Brazil first appears on maps as far back as 1325, including surviving maps by Angelino Dolcer, an Italian cartographer. High Brazil continued to be depicted on maps well into the 16th century, nearly always displayed as an almost perfectly circular island with a powerful river running directly from one side to the other. The ancient High Brazil is considered today to be a phantom island one that was never documented properly and most likely never reached at all, considered to be a myth or legend. However, other historians and scientists alike believe that High Brazil was not only the inspiration for the name of Brazil in South America, but they may actually be the same place. We're told, according to the currently accepted narrative, that Brazil, the country, was named so for the abundance of Brazil wood trees that were found there. Brazil wood, however, as the name of a tree, appears nowhere in the world until the Portuguese first arrive to Brazil. The Brazil wood tree is endemic to Brazil the country. It's a chicken or the egg sort of argument, one that to me, the narrative doesn't do much justice in explaining. We're told the word Brazil essentially means fiery, bright red, passionate, or sturdy to the 16th century Portuguese. The tree, which we know today as Brazil wood, produces a bright red dye, which in those times became world famous. Thus, we're told the tree was named Brazil wood by the Portuguese, meaning basically fiery red tree or sturdy red tree. After the Brazil wood trade began to boom, we're told the land in which it was found, which was first called the Island of the True Cross, and then the land of the Holy Cross became known simply as Brazil. We are told the Brazil of South America bears no relation to the Celtic Viking Phoenician and Canaanite sailors and their mystical island of High Brazil. No relation to the mystical island that was written about in the sagas, this island far off the west coast of Ireland, across the Atlantic. However, in real life, across the Atlantic, into the southern hemisphere, you will find Brazil. No relation here to High Brazil, a land of massive trees and beautiful landscapes, which was, according to Celtic myth, only visible once every seven years and was only visited by the finest of the first men, known as the heroes. The Brazil of South America, also well known for its trees and landscapes, is said to be a completely separate creation. The currently accepted narrative says that the first Europeans to ever reach the land that is today Brazil, occurred in the year 1500 when Pedro Alvarez Cabral and the Portuguese arrived. Upon more prying into this narrative, not only do we have Captain Jean Cousin, a Frenchman, claiming to have arrived in Brazil through the mouth of the Amazon in 1488, four years before Columbus reached the New World, but we actually have multiple sources throughout the years which seem to substantiate this claim. However, modern day scientists and historians claim that all evidence of Jean Cousin's arrival in Brazil in 1488 is considered to be pseudoscience. If you're familiar with old world history, this next bit of the narrative really brings everything full circle. And if not, I'll try to explain it to you in layman's terms. In the year 1555, we're told Nicolas Durand de Villagayon, a French commander of the Order of Malta, arrived in what is today Rio de Janeiro with roughly 200 men, where he is said to have sailed to the nearest island off the coast and built a massive star fortress. This was to be the first capital of French Antarctique, a plan by France to occupy the southernmost lands known to mankind. However, could this have been a plan to find the ancient 
and mysterious lands, the Greenlands, in the Southern Pole that are depicted on many early maps. Antarctique, the French spelling, certainly reminds me of Tartaria. Why is this important? Where this secret Catholic Order of Malta went, amazing star fortresses appeared to follow. In a span of months, these knights, not architects, would construct massive fortifications with geometrical perfection that would exist for centuries to come, many of which still surviving today. However, what if this Order of Malta served a secondary purpose? What if it was a reclamation team? We see that they are hired by kingdoms, the rich, those who founded the fortunes, to reclaim other lost fortunes and the fortifications that housed them. It's a theme that we see recurrently in movies and books and even throughout medieval history. First you would send out something of an explorer to find the New World fortresses, the Columbuses of the world, who map and archive the locations and confirm ancient information that they have received about these kingdoms existence. Following this, the kingdoms that hired these explorers would then hire knights, the literal hired armies like those of Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings, to go and reclaim these ancient fortresses. All of the knowledge of these goings is relatively hidden. The fortresses remained off the grid untouched, thus why they are so desirable. Any knowledge of them would be considered esoteric. Once the area is confirmed to be real and it is cleared by these armies like the Order of Malta, they would basically set up within this conquered area, often a fortress, and allow for new settlers from the kingdom that hired them to be shipped to the area. Basically, colonizing. Once the settlers arrived, the powers of that kingdom seemed to work diligently to renovate the structures, to make the history their own, before releasing all of this information to the greater public for consumption. From here, the history becomes a storybook. We have warfare that occurs in almost every major city, combined with occurrences labeled as natural events, but seemingly cataclysmic, that drive forward the idea that these cities have been destroyed, dismantled, and rebuilt multiple times. So even if we wanted to find evidence of the first men and these first structures, the narrative leads us to believe it's not possible. In my educated opinion, the true history of the area and in most of these major cities it appears to be the same is that these forts that we talk about already existed in one form or another. In some instances, they are considered to be earthworks or mounds. However, we have other examples that seem to point to 
actual masonry being used, stones being cut, or polymers being poured. There are many theories out there, but what we can agree on is that there was some sort of united society or some group of the first men who developed proto-language and proto-mathematics, proto-science, known as alchemy. And these early generations followed them, and they had these structures that were all very similar around the world. Eventually, these structures were abandoned, and this most likely occurred during a cataclysm, or during multiple cataclysms, these being the cataclysms that are written about in the ancient texts all around the world. I believe numerous materials exist that dive into what actually happened with much more detail, and I believe these materials were discovered in the 14th, the 15th, the 16th centuries by these kingdoms, and they led to the creation of the secret societies that we talk about today. It also led to the creation of the libraries and the secret museums of the Vatican, the Smithsonian, and other organizations like that, which laid out the true history and then reshaped it. I believe these hidden artifacts, especially the earliest ones from BC times, allowed for the power structure that we have today to be created. It allowed for a feudal system and for the governments that followed. After this cataclysmic event, or any cataclysmic event that is written about in these cultures, it appears certain groups of people often emerge and take control. First by claiming the kingdoms, then by expanding them, and finally by joining them under certain banners of religion. These kingdoms, in my opinion, powerful groups as they looted more cataclysmic ruins, would continue to find artifacts, maps, and technology which only would increase their power throughout the centuries. This struggle became how the rest of the society was in the dark. It comes full circle when we discuss lands like High Brazil, the lost kingdom across the Atlantic to the ancient Celtic people of Ireland. High Brazil said to be reachable only by the most powerful heroes written about in the lost sagas, leading to many similar ancient Indo-Aryan tales of mythical islands and lost lands. I believe Rio de Janeiro was a kingdom that was built before the cataclysm, as related to in its immense fortifications, star forts, and I believe the Order of Malta arrived, hired to pillage the area for this ancient and esoteric knowledge. The process continued from the 1500s through the 1850s until the reset of the world was eventually complete. Essentially, Rio de Janeiro was just another city that had this happen to it on this timeline. But again, that's just my opinion. Back to the narrative, which we will go through rapidly now for the remainder of the video, just listing all facts in this timeline. In 1565, we're told Estacio de Sá, a simple officer of Portugal, was sent across the Atlantic to what is today Rio de Janeiro to destroy the French Antarctic colony there. He succeeded, and Rio de Janeiro was established in 1565 by the Portuguese. That same year, the Portuguese are said to have destroyed the Order of Malta Fort, only to build their own, the Fort of St. John. By 1600, multiple other forts are founded in Rio by the Portuguese, culminating in the St. James of Mercy Fort, being completed in 1603. Throughout this time period, Rio continued to flourish in Brazilwood trade and was a key trade destination for European travelers to the New World. One of, if not the largest ship in the world at this time, was completed in Rio de Janeiro in 1663, known as Padre Eterno, or Eternal Father, and was used primarily to transport goods back to Portugal from Brazil. In 1693, the Calabouz prison was completed. By the early 1700s, multiple large schools and colleges had opened throughout Rio, and in 1743, the Imperial Palace of Rio de Janeiro was completed. Even more impressive, the Carioca Aqueduct was completed in 1750, an ingenious piece of architecture which provided the entire city with fresh water. The administrative center for Portuguese America was moved from Salvador to Rio de Janeiro in 1763, and in 1770, the old cathedral of Rio de Janeiro was officially consecrated. 
the Paseo Publico was officially founded in 1783, making it the oldest public park in all of Brazil and one of the first public parks in all of the New World. In 1792, the Military Institute of Engineering opened in Rio, the oldest engineering school in all of Brazil. In 1803, a second imperial palace is founded, even larger and more robust than the first. By 1808, a slew of official changes arrived to Rio when Rio de Janeiro becomes the capital of the Kingdom of Portugal. The first royal printing press begins operation that same year, and by September of 1808, the Rio Gazette begins circulation. The Roman Catholic Candelaria Church is inaugurated in 1811. Meanwhile, construction on the Valongo Wharf begins. By 1815, Rio de Janeiro is named capital of the United Kingdom of Portugal, Brazil, and the Algarves. And in 1818, the Royal Museum is established in Rio. By 1822, the expansive and extensive botanical gardens are opened, one of the finest in the Americas. And also in 1822, Rio becomes a capital of independent Brazil. By the mid 1800s, we have multiple advanced buildings housing a multitude of different organizations, including a steady population of journalists who begin to call Rio de Janeiro home. In 1838, the Brazilian Historic and Geographic Institute opens, and in 1852, the largest theater in Brazil at that time, the Teatro Provisorio, opens in Rio. In 1854, the sprawling Catete Palace is completed in Rio, which, by 1858, is receiving regular locomotive travel through the Dom Pedro II Railway. The Brazil Central Station in Rio opens this same year, and by 1871, an even larger theater opens and is inaugurated, known as the Teatro Dom Pedro II. By 1873, the population of Rio exceeds 275,000 people for the first time, and the city is an ever-growing amalgamation of architectural techniques reminiscent of the old world. Technology in the city booms around this time, culminating in the 1877 opening of the Santa Teresa Tram, which traversed the city of Rio. In 1884, the Cocovado Rock Railway opens, and in 1891, the Journal of Brazil begins its publication in Rio. In 1894, one of the earliest and most famous coffee houses in the entire world, the Confetaria Colombo, opens in Rio, and in 1896, the Brazilian Academy of Letters also opens in the city. I'd usually stop the narrative as we begin to enter the 20th century. However, we have some really interesting tidbits after the turn of the century, which really help to shape our understanding of Rio. In 1904, there is a revolt. To keep it brief, in the year 1902, Rio was considered one of the largest and most beautiful cities in the world. However, the infrastructure was said to be crumbling, and the people in the slums of the city 
did not often take care of themselves. This is when President Rodriguez Alves ordered Mayor Passos and Health Director Oswaldo Cruz to essentially cleanse the city. What followed was a series of destructive events, we're told, enacted to tear down the ancient architecture, the old buildings, and the old streets, dig below them, and to open and expand the sewer system to modernize Rio de Janeiro with steel buildings. This, however, also involved the people. As we're told, for lack of a better term, the government went from home to home, from slum to slum, and rounded up the homeless to be put into asylums or almshouses or even into prison. The entire population, poor or not, were also made to be inoculated for all known diseases at the time. This was done by force, leading to much violence in the streets. Also in 1904, Central Avenue, running through the heart of downtown, was completed. However, the biggest spectacle to occur in this timeline during this decade may come to us from 1906, when the Monroe Palace was erected in Rio de Janeiro. This building, enormous and Romanesque, seemingly out of place and beyond the means of the lands that surrounded it, was actually a building that was transported from the United States to Rio de Janeiro. Many of you may have heard this story before, and it's still hard to make sense of even to this day. In the year 1904, a World's Fair was being held in St. Louis, Missouri. I can't recommend enough, but please check out my previous videos on the World's Fair in St. Louis. We have over 500 photographs that I had never before seen published, and I put them all into a series of three videos, which are probably the most detailed videos, at least photographically, that you can find on the World's Fair in St. Louis. So definitely check those out after this video. But getting back into Rio, we have this building that was designed to be a temporary building at the World's Fair. All of these buildings popping up in a matter of months. One of the largest and most immense of these temporary buildings was the building that was built by Brazil for this World's Fair in St. Louis. The building, of course, was the Monroe Building, also known as the Monroe Palace. Now, this structure, which was very beautiful, was said to be initially a temporary building built by Brazil for the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. However, this Monroe Palace, this Monroe Building, was so popular at the fair and the Brazilians liked the design so much that they decided that they would take it apart in pieces and ship it back to Rio de Janeiro where it would be reassembled and made to be permanent. Many of you have heard about this before, but the convoluted part about this story is that 99% or more of the other buildings from the St. Louis World's Fair were temporary. They were made to be destroyed, and many of them fell apart during the course of the fair. At least, that's what we're told in the narrative. We're led to believe these are throwaway buildings. The Monroe Palace, however, was meticulously taken apart, piece by piece, loaded onto multiple ships and barges and sailed through the Atlantic Ocean back to Rio de Janeiro, where all of these quote-unquote disposable pieces were loaded then onto carts, hauled into the middle of Rio de Janeiro, reassembled all the while. These disposable aspects of the original structure were said to be replaced by materials with more longevity. Does that seem just a little bit convoluted to you? We have the Monroe Building opening in Rio in 1906, housing the Brazilian Parliament for decades, only to be torn down in the 1970s. In 1908, the new city flag of Rio de Janeiro was designed and adopted.
Also in 1908, a World's Fair of sorts, a world exhibition, was held in Rio, celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the opening of the ports of Brazil. One million people or more attended this exhibition. From here, the history becomes more convoluted, as a cornucopia of old-world-looking Romanesque buildings are founded throughout the city and said to be brand new structures mixed with new buildings of steel. The Teatro Municipal in 1909, Alfonso Air Force Base, as well as the Police Museum in 1912. By 1920, the population of Rio de Janeiro has easily exceeded 1 million residents, and from here, we have an abundance of modernization of Rio that continues to occur. The old world style buildings begin to make way for new steel structures being pushed by the powers of the city. However, even to this day, if you look at photographs of Rio, you can see that the city has maintained much of its old world charm, having many identifiable structures which indicate the nature and the age of the architecture. We can look through the images of Rio and we can compare the history of Brazil and of High Brazil. We can discuss the implications of secret sex and the orders like the Knights of Malta who work predominantly to reshape history and within these kingdoms like Rio de Janeiro within the castles and the fortresses, the store forts and the ancient walls, we can still find buried below centuries of this convolution the true evidence that these cities could have, in fact, been larger, been much more important than history really gives them credit for. But what do you think? I'd love to hear your opinion in the comment section down below. What did you see in these photographs of Rio de Janeiro? And does the current narrative history appear to coincide with what is shown in these images? What can we deduce about this narrative? Let me know down below if there's anything that stands out to you in this video. And thanks again for joining me today. This information, these photographs, this is really my passion. And to know that you share, even in part, this passion with me and you're here to enjoy these photographs and to learn a little bit, it makes it all worth the while. Please like this video if you haven't. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. And join me here for the next video dealing with some portion of old world history. I look forward to seeing you there. Cheers.